Today, I'll be talking about esophageal varices and the general management of acute GI hemorrhage in cirrhosis. By the end of the video, you'll be able to describe the relevant anatomy and pathophysiology behind the development of esophageal varices, to list preventative measures that can be taken to prevent bleeding from esophageal varices, and to describe specific considerations in the treatment of variceal bleeding, including transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunts, better known as TIPS. The most significant factor in cirrhosis that increases a patient's predilection for GI bleeding is portal hypertension, leading to portal systemic shunts, which are either abnormal or exaggerated means of collateral blood flow between the portal venous system and the systemic veins. Spending a minute to review the relevant anatomy here will be helpful. Here are some of the organs of the abdominal cavity. We have the small and large intestines, the stomach, the spleen, and of course the liver. In order to better see the veins, let's pull these organs apart a little. So what veins do we have? In the posterior of the patient, the largest vein in the body is the inferior vena cava, which is fed by the right and left common iliac veins, as well as the hepatic veins. There is also the azygous vein, which is the backbone of a subsidiary venous system that drains the posterior abdominal wall. This small vein feeding it is one of the esophageal veins. Draining the intestines, there is the superior and inferior mesenteric veins. Here is the splenic vein. This little one here is the left gastric vein, which drains part of the stomach and the distal end of the esophagus. Collectively, those all eventually flow into the portal vein, which then divides into the right and left portal vein as it enters the liver. This collection of veins, which drain into the portal vein, is known as the portal venous system, or alternatively, the hepatic portal system. The role of the hepatic portal system is to bring blood from the intestine that is rich in nutrients from recently ingested and digested food, and potentially some toxins as well, directly to the liver to be metabolized. In cirrhosis, both resistance to portal blood flow increases, as well as the portal flow rate itself, so there is more blood trying to squeeze through tighter blood vessels. As you may recall from physiology, the pressure gradient between two points equals the flow times resistance, so this leads to a higher pressure in the portal vein. High pressure in the portal vein results in blood being redirected to alternate routes back to the heart. There are a number of portal cable anastomoses between the portal and systemic venous system where this can happen. The most notable of these is in the esophagus, whereby blood from the intestines travels backwards through the left gastric vein and ends up in the esophageal veins draining to the zygous system. These veins that surround the esophagus aren't designed to handle this volume and pressure of blood, so over time they become tortuous and dilate, developing into esophageal varices. Here's a chart of the more clinically relevant locations of portosystemic shunts. In addition to esophageal varices, one can also develop gastric varices, which have significantly more anatomic variety, as these can drain into the azygous vein, directly into the IVC, or even to the left renal vein. If the paraumbilical vein in the round ligament of the liver becomes recanalized, that can develop into a collection of dilated veins on the abdominal wall that radiate out from the umbilicus. This physical finding is called caput medusae, or head of medusa, since the veins can look like the snakes emanating from the medusa's head. And shunting of blood from the portal to systemic venous system that occurs in the rectum can lead to hemorrhoids. In addition to portal hypertension, another contributing factor to GI bleeding in cirrhosis is the decreased synthesis of clotting factors. This increases the severity of bleeds that occur for other reasons, rather than causing de novo bleeds on its own. And last, remember that all other mechanisms that occur in patients without cirrhosis can also occur in patients with cirrhosis. In my personal experience, the most common scenario is a patient with alcoholic cirrhosis who's presenting with an upper GI bleed, where you work on the assumption that it may be from esophageal varices, but when the patient receives endoscopy, it's discovered to be something like alcohol-induced gastritis. Focusing just on esophageal varices, about one half of patients will have them at the time their cirrhosis is diagnosed, and one third of those who develop varices will eventually experience a variceal hemorrhage. 
Here's what they look like on endoscopy. This is in the esophagus, and those bumpy purplish things spanning from 2 o'clock to 8 o'clock, those are the varices. Variceal hemorrhages are typically life-threatening and a significant cause of mortality with a 6-week mortality rate of 15 to 20 percent. Because of this, and because they can be treated before hemorrhage occurs, all patients with a new diagnosis of cirrhosis should have a screening EGD to look for their presence and to have them potentially treated right then if specific criteria are met. Options for endoscopic treatment include variceal ligation, also known as banding, in which rubber bands are placed around each varix, resulting in the varix thrombosing off. Another option is sclerotherapy, in which a sclerosing solution is injected into the varix. In general, ligation is the preferred option. I'm going to spend just a minute on the concept of endoscopy for those viewers who have never seen it before. There are many different types of endoscopy. The word basically refers to any procedure in which a flexible tube equipped with a light and fiber optic camera is inserted into the body through either the mouth or the rectum to examine part of the GI tract. The specific type of endoscopy that's relevant for this discussion is an esophago-gastroduodenoscopy, known colloquially as an EGD, and less precisely as a so-called upper endoscopy. This is an endoscope. This end is called the light guide connector, and it attaches to a big cart on which there is a monitor to watch what one is doing in real time. This is the control body or control section, which allows the operator to maneuver the camera. There are also buttons for water flushes and suction. You can't see it well in the picture, but right about here is an opening to introduce instruments that can be used to deliver therapies. And this is the insertion end that actually goes into the patient, the distal tip of which can bend in different directions under control of the operator. We already saw a picture of varices on EGD, but here are some other GI pathologies. This is looking down the esophagus. Those linear lesions at 5 and 6 o'clock are literal tears in the mucosa caused by repeated vomiting or retching. These are known as Mallory Weiss tears and are a common source of GI bleeding in both cirrhotics and non cirrhotics this is a picture of a gastric ulcer in a patient with peptic ulcer disease. And this is also in the stomach, which shows a condition called portal hypertensive gastropathy, characterized by a reticular pattern of white lines that resembles a snake skin. This is another complication of portal hypertension, most commonly found incidentally, or determined to be the source of a slow chronic GI bleed, but it can also rarely lead to a dramatic acute hemorrhage of similar presentation to a variceal bleed. In addition to prophylactic endoscopic treatment, patients can also receive prophylaxis against variceal hemorrhage with beta blockers. Non-selective beta blockers block beta-2 mediated dilation in the mesenteric arterioles, resulting in vasoconstriction and subsequent decreased portal blood flow. Indications for primary prophylaxis, that is for patients with varices that have never bled before, include the presence of medium or large varices, or if they are small, but the patient has one or more risk factors for bleeding, such as child's class B or C cirrhosis, which means moderate to severe, or a red sign, also known as a whale mark, which is a focal red dot or splotch on a varix when viewed endoscopically. Everyone who has a history of a variceal bleed should be placed on a beta blocker, irrespective of the size of varix or other risk factors. Conventional options for beta blockers to prevent variceal bleeds include propranolol, nadolol, and carvedilol. So now, what happens if a patient with cirrhosis actually presents with an apparent upper GI bleed? To know it's from varices will require an EGD, which will take some time to set up. So before focusing on varices specific treatment, let's discuss some general management principles for any cirrhosis patient presenting with an acute bleed. The single most important general principle is to consider that all such patients may be possibly experiencing a life-threatening upper GI bleed until proven otherwise, regardless of whether the patient is presenting with hematemesis, melena, or hematochesia, regardless of whether the volume is small or large, or whether the patient is hemodynamically stable or not. What does such a consideration entail? 
Well, support hemodynamics by establishing secure IV access. Two large peripheral IVs are better than a routine triple lumen central line. Then start infusing either IV fluids and or packed red blood cells. Remember that the baseline systolic blood pressure and cirrhosis can run relatively low. 90s to 100s is not uncommon. Also, current hemoglobin levels don't reflect the degree of an acute hemorrhage. When people hemorrhage, they hemorrhage whole blood, not just red blood cells. So the hemoglobin concentration remains the same until various mechanisms cause internal redistribution of fluids into the intravascular space, a process which may take as long as 12 to 24 hours. In addition to supporting hemodynamics, you'll want to correct any underlying coagulopathy. This means transfusing fresh frozen plasma or FFP to bring down the INR. There is no specific universal goal INR, but in my experience, around 1.6 seems to be a relatively typical goal of most GI and critical care docs. Transfuse platelets to a goal of above 50,000. You can consider administering vitamin K, but realize that the onset of action may take hours, and it may be of low effectiveness if the patient is not actually vitamin K deficient. What are some medications that should be started while waiting for endoscopy? Most patients receive two. Octreotide, which is a long-acting somatostatin analog, which inhibits the release of vasodilating hormones, leading to splanchnic vasoconstriction, reducing portal flow. It's given as a 50 microgram bolus, followed by 50 micrograms per hour for three to five days. Outside the U.S., terlipressin is sometimes used instead of octreotide. These meds are specifically used for bleeding esophageal varices. The other class of medication that should be administered is pantoprazole or another intravenous proton pump inhibitor, which is empirically used predominantly for peptic ulcer disease and gastritis. Once a diagnosis is established via endoscopy, either medication which is not felt to be indicated is of course stopped. In addition, data shows that when prophylactic antibiotics are given in the setting of GI bleeding, these patients have lower mortality, shorter hospital stays, and even a lower chance of rebleeding. Infections complicate about 20% of hospitalizations for upper GI bleeding and cirrhosis, with UTIs and spontaneous bacterial peritonitis being the most commonly observed. The choice of antibiotics should be guided by local resistance patterns, but conventional choices include ceftriaxone and the quinolones norfloxacin and ciprofloxacin. A typical course is seven days, but I've seen five days used as well. In addition to empiric and prophylactic medications, also monitor for common complications of an acute upper GI bleed. Upper GI bleeds can trigger the other three big acute complications of cirrhosis, SBP, hepatorenal syndrome, and hepatic encephalopathy. And last, of course, these patients all require emergent endoscopy. The combination of hemodynamic support, correction of coagulopathy, a vasoactive medication like octreotide, and endoscopy is successful at controlling the vast majority of esophageal bleeds. But there are a few rarely employed therapies for those bleeds which are refractory. The first is balloon tamponade. This temporary intervention is reserved for patients who may exsanguinate before definitive therapy can be performed, either because the quantity of bleeding is profound, or because endoscopy is delayed, or endoscopy was unsuccessful and the clinicians need to buy time for something more dramatic. There are several different contraptions that are used to achieve balloon tamponade. This is a diagram of one called the senstaken blakemore tube, or often just Blakemore tube. The placement of a Senstaken Blakemore tube is not trivial, and you should never attempt to place one without being appropriately trained. Risks include esophageal necrosis and rupture, the latter of which is often fatal. As endoscopy has become more refined and more widely available, the use of these tubes has dropped off considerably. Now I mentioned that one of the indications for these tubes is to buy time for a more dramatic, long-term solution. What are they? One is an emergent TIPS procedure. TIPS itself is not rare, but it's usually an elective procedure to treat refractory ascites and is only rarely used as emergent management of a variceal bleed. Let me discuss TIPS for a minute. This stands for transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt, 
It involves the creation of a low resistance pathway between a hepatic vein and an intrahepatic branch of the portal vein using an expandable metal stent. This offloads the portal venous system, reducing portal pressures. The procedure is performed percutaneously, usually by interventional radiology. The two indications for a TIPS, recurrent or refractory variceal hemorrhage, and as already mentioned, refractory ascites. There are many contraindications for TIPS placement. An abbreviated list includes active infection or sepsis, severe coagulopathy and or thrombocytopenia, portal vein thrombosis, hepatic encephalopathy, heart failure, or severe tricuspid regurgitation. By far, the most common complication is hepatic encephalopathy. If you happen to know anything about encephalopathy, this makes sense since the tips would allow recently ingested toxins and absorbed compounds like ammonia to bypass the liver and enter directly into the systemic circulation, leading to higher ammonia levels in the brain. Uncommon and rare complications include periprocedural infection, periprocedural hemorrhage, hemolytic anemia caused by mechanical trauma of red blood cells passing through the stent, hyperbilirubinemia, independent of the presence of hemolysis, and shunt stenosis or occlusion. And the absolute last choice for the definitive management of a life-threatening and refractory variceal bleed is an emergent surgical procedure to create a portal systemic shunt. There are various surgical options, all of which have high rates of achieving chemostasis, but with extremely high rates of perioperative mortality. That concludes this video on esophageal varices and the management of acute GI hemorrhage and cirrhosis. I hope you'll consider viewing my other videos on the acute complications of cirrhosis, including SBP, hepatic encephalopathy, and the hepatorenal syndrome.